Our scripture passage um, is from the Gospel of Luke, and um, this was, uh, I just took it from the lectionary readings. This is Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, friend, who sent me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. Sometimes you read a passage of scripture um, and you're left thinking, okay, that's interesting, uh, but I'm not really sure how it applies to the modern world. So like, uh, for example, Chris, a few weeks ago, preached a sermon um, on a passage from Acts about the Jerusalem Council. And, um, and at that council, leaders of the early church decided that Gentile Christians should not eat food that had been sacrificed to idols. Interesting, right? Um, but not relevant to us um, in any kind of literal way. Uh, because in our culture, people, I don't think, are sac I don't think people are sacrificing food to idols in our culture. It's not really um, a temptation for us. Then there are passages that might feel a little too relevant for comfort. Um, stories or exchanges that could very well happen today. Um, and that's what I thought when I was reading today's passage. Um, where a man um, asked Jesus for help in persuading his brother to split the family inheritance with him. And really, what could be a more universal human experience than arguing and haggling over money? That is eternal, it seems. Um, or arguing who gets what when a family member dies or when a parent dies. Um, if there's not, I'm surprised that there doesn't exist an entire like reality series about this very situation. Splitting the inheritance. Um, now, of course, there are elements to the story from today that do not translate to our context. So, uh, for example, according to the law, firstborn sons would get double the inheritance of all the other siblings. Um, so, so there's a built-in favoritism for firstborns, um, firstborn sons in particular, um, and we don't really deal, I don't think that's really kind of an institutional problem that we deal with here. Um, but then there's also the obvious sexism of the patriarchal system. So daughters would not get any of the inheritance. Um, but actually, dividing the inheritance at that time um, it wasn't actually the only option that people had. It was actually seen as preferable not to split the inheritance up, but for the sons to keep living together at the family homestead and not divide anything. Um, but it seems like this man who approaches Jesus, he is one of the younger brothers, and he wants his portion of the inheritance. He wants to set out on his own. Um, but as we all know, Jesus isn't really one to, to give an easy answer, is he? He doesn't give yes or no answers. 
Um, so his first statement is interesting. Um, he says, friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? Um, and that's a funny thing for Jesus to say because it was very common for people to ask rabbis or teachers of the law like Jesus um, to ask them to rule or to weigh in on questions exactly like this. But Jesus doesn't want to do that. Uh, so instead, he ignores this man's request. He ignores his question. And then he shifts the conversation to a bigger, more central question. And that question is about desire and particularly the desire for wealth and the desire for possessions. Um, so as an answer, he's, he tells this parable of the rich fool, um, a man whose land produces abundantly so much that he has more crops than he knows what to do with. He can't even store all these crops. So what does he do? He decides to build a bigger barn and bank the excess. He saves it. Um, does anybody here work with a financial planner? And I'm not even saying, I'm not trying to cast aspersions on that. Um, if you were to ask a financial planner uh, for their opinion on this decision, they would say, the fool was actually very wise. Um, they would probably say, actually, if it, was, if it was today, they would say, sell the crops, invest the money. Um, but the bottom line would be, do whatever makes you the most money. Um, because the more money you have, the more savings you have, the more assets you have, the better off you are. That's the phrase. Um, it is in your best interest. But the irony of the story is that Jesus calls this guy a fool for doing the smart thing. Um, he's a fool for planning for his future in this way. Uh, but what, what makes him foolish? Um, the rich man is foolish, according to Jesus' words. Um, he's foolish because he thinks wealth is going to give him security, and he thinks it's going to give him control over his life. It's going to give him the freedom to live how he wants to live, right? He's going to eat good food. He's going to drink good wine. Um, he's going to relax. Basically, he's going to have a good time. But the end of the parable makes it clear that ultimately, um, this man has very little control over his life. Um, and the idea that money is going to give him the control and security that he craves this is actually an illusion. It's a delusion. Um, there are other reasons, I think, why the rich man um, is foolish, or at least short-sighted. Um, so, and you can actually see it in this little soliloquy that he gives, um, and in the way he speaks. Um, so he says, what should I do? I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns. I'm going to build larger ones. And there I'm going to store all my grain and all my goods. I hope I have the last one. Here we go. <laughs> Who's the fool? Uh, I'll build new barns so I can store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax. Um, is there anything from that, uh, any rep repetition in there that you heard? Anything that stick out? Yeah. What should I do? I will do this. I will pull down my barns, build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Lots of eyes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Lots of eyes, lots of my, right? Um, so the man consults himself, right? He doesn't ask God, what should I do with this excess that I have? Um, so he's clearly living for himself. He's living for his own desires. But I think 
that even though this rich man, according to Jesus, is foolish, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that, that this way of thinking, um, it's actually the status quo, right? This is normal. This is the normal way of thinking. Um, it's commonplace. It is actually considered wise, um, which I think makes it um, especially dangerous to us. Um, and that's why Jesus says, be on your guard. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Uh, be on your guard because this kind of foolishness is regarded in our world as wisdom. Um, it's regarded as being prudent or having common sense. Save up the excess that you have. Um, it's something to aspire to. Eat, drink, relax, be happy. It's your life and the purpose of your life is to enjoy it. Um, here is what one commentator that I read this week, here's what he writes. And I think it's um, pretty insightful. The message of this parable is as antithetical to our thinking as any other parable that Jesus tells. I know of no more difficult topic to apply personally or to the lives of modern Western Christians. Our primary pursuits are our own security and our own pleasure, and both we think are achieved by possessions and wealth. However, one could in fact say, at least as far as Jesus is concerned, that possessions are one of the chief obstacles to salvation and one of the chief obstacles to living a life with God. And the fact that this, that this message is so antithetical to our way of thinking, antithetical to what our culture tells us, um, anti antithetical, honestly, to how we are raised within this culture, um, I think it, it means that if we want to live the, um, the life that Jesus calls us to live, it's not as simple as just choosing not to want these things. Um, that doesn't work. For me, it doesn't. Uh, we, we cannot escape these desires by sheer force of will. Um, I think they need to be replaced by something else. Um, and that means we need a different culture to participate in um, and to be supported by, right? To be um, formed by. And this is where the church comes in, or um, it's where the church should come in. Um, we need a community that values and models generosity um, and open-handedness. Um, and really what it boils down to, I think, is uh, we need a community that models radical trust in God, um, where our security and our well-being and our satisfaction um, are not earned, um, but they're given to us as gifts from God. Um, in the next section of Luke, Jesus says, don't worry, don't fear. Um, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, give you. Um, and that sounds like the language of inheritance, doesn't it? But it takes transformation to actually want that inheritance. Um, instead of the world's inheritance, which is money, possessions, false security. Um, in our house church, some of the most meaningful conversations for me have been ones where we talk about our personal finances openly and honestly, um, where we might ask help for, dis for discerning what to do with our money. So for example, what should we do with this house that we own, that we rent to other people? What is a, what is a kingdom use for this? Um, or what should we do with this extra money that we've come in, that we've come into that we don't need right now? Um, and I think these kinds of conversations are what the church is for, right? It's the opposite actually of what we see the rich fool doing, right? Where he asks himself, what should I do with this stuff? Um, what should I do with my crops? Um, but according to Jesus, the wise thing to do is to recognize that every single thing that we have, everything, um, our jobs, our money, 
possessions, um, our, our very breath, right? Our lives. All of those things are given to us by God. So I encourage us in our house churches or in our conversations with each other um, to make talk and discernment about money less taboo. Um, because we're taught not to talk about. Um, but we can resist that. Uh, we can support each other. We can challenge each other to trust God more and more. Because I think that's what really the bedrock issue is, trusting God. Uh, because this is where true security, satisfaction, and joy are found. They are gifts that God is happy to give us. Amen.